Uh, hello all and welcome to the Rails board meeting. This is Friday, March 18th, and I am Tom Stagg, president of the Rails board. I call this meeting to order at one o'clock. Uh, Emily, will you please call roll? Sure. Sue Busenberg. Here. Ellie Cox. Here. Alice Creason. Here. Robin Hellenthal. Here. Diane Hollister. Chris Kenny. You're muted, Chris. Here. Jennifer McIntosh. Here. Scott Poynton. Here. Becky Spratford. Here. Thomas Stagg. Here. Beth Teppen. Monica Tolva. Here. Alex Vancina. Here. And Karen Wojtek. Here. <coughs> okay. Uh, Rick, <coughs> you okay, Sue? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, recognition of guests and announcements. Uh, we will handle guests and public comments at the same time. Uh, let's start here in East Peoria. Hi, Kendall Orson Rails. Uh, thank you, Kendall. Kendall's trying to stay out of the picture, but uh, <laughs> uh, now, now what guests are present in Burr Ridge? Emily, will you read the okay. names of the Oh. Let's start, Let's with, start with Monica. <laughs> Hi, Monica Harris Rails. <laughs> That's all, Tom. That's all? Okay. That's all. Uh, in, in the Why room, yeah. Here, <laughs> <laughs> Emily, will you read the names of the guests who are participating via Zoom? Sure. Emily Feister Rails, Sharon Swanson Rails, Janet Daruki Rails, did I pronounce that correctly? Samantha Daly Rails, Jessica Barnes Rails, Catherine Hentz Rails, Brian Hebel Rails, Stacy Palmasano Rails, Mark Hatch Rails, Mary Witt Rails, Joe Filipek Rails, Layla Heath Rails, Elena Mendoza Rails, Dan Bostrom Rails. And I know there's someone at ISL, but I can't see who's there. Or maybe they're not in our meeting. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> they very well could be. <laughs> okay. Um, we're handling public comments via Zoom or previous submissions to Emily. Uh, Emily, did you receive any comments? I did not. Okay. Uh, does, if, since there were none sent in, does anyone have any public comments? None. Okay, so let's go on to number five, the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda items are adoption of the agenda, the Rails board minutes of February 25th, the regular board meeting, and 5.3, approval of disbursements, uh, February 2022. Uh, may I have a motion and second for adoption of the consent agenda? So moved, <clears throat> Alex. Alex, thank you. I'll Alex. second. I'll second. Uh, thanks, Scott. Scott. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Uh, motion carried. Uh, next, we have Sharon Swanson with the Rails Financial Report. Sharon? Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. The um, February 28th unassigned general fund cash and investment balance of $22.4 million would fund approximately 23.3 months of operations. Revenues through February of over $10 million were um, 
a little over 1.45 million above budget. And this is primarily from the February 18th receipt of the remaining two live and learn payments from the APC grants. These total $2,145,000. As of this point in time, uh, the only remaining payment from the APC grant that we are expecting is the federal or LSTA payment of a little over 1.9 million, which is used to support our delivery operations. And in other grant news, very exciting, Rails received the $12,162.81, and I'm gonna be exact about this, um, in FEMA grant funds yesterday. And this was the amount that we had applied for at the beginning of the pandemic, then the criteria excluded us, and then they changed the criteria again until we were eligible and we needed to apply yet again. So we finally received those funds after two years of a lot of work. So we are very pleased. Investment income, um, moving on, was 12497 through $12,497 through February, which is $6,695 below the budgeted amount. Um, the money market rates just recently rose above the 0.14% per um, rate that we had budgeted, and both Illinois funds and Hinsdale Bank's interest rates increased to 0.136% and 0.186% since January. Interest rates had either remained, un remained unchanged or declined for a year prior to the gradual increases that began um, this past October. And for the first time this calendar year, interest rate, interest rate predictions did not change since I wrote my report. So the Federal Reserve is still expected to raise interest rates up to seven times during this calendar year. The first and largest increase of which um, is 0.25% was just approved earlier this week. So the predictions indicate that they are likely to raise interest rates to 1.9% by the calendar year end, but they're still expected to be cautious to avoid raising rates too quickly, which might throw the country into another recession as happened in 2008 and 2009. So that 1.9% is still iffy at this point. So during the month of February, Rails did invest in a series of treasury notes with laddered maturities every six months, as I've been talking about over the next two years. On the returns, on these investments range from 0.209% to 0.9%. Um, and they have two components. One component is that semi-annual um, coupon interest that we get every six months. The other component will be the $27,301 difference between the purchase price and the face value of the investments. The second component of returns will not be earned evenly over the holding period of these investments um, and is expected to be recorded almost in its entirety when each of these treasury notes mature, given the direction that interest rates are taking. Um, the fair market value of um, uh, approximately 3.84 million decreased by $8,619 during the month of February. And this fair market value represents the amount that Rails could expect to recover as of February 28th from disposing of these investments prior to their maturities, which is not, will not be necessary in our case. The fair market value will fluctuate as interest rates change, but will gradually increase to the face value of the investments as they near their maturity dates, or more sharply increase to that amount as we near the maturity dates. So since the interest rates, as I mentioned, are expected to rise over the calendar, over the calendar year, I would like to emphasize that we may temporarily fall behind the market rates, and I've emphasized this this last month, but with maturities occurring every six months, we should be able to stay even with the market overall while we build a longer term investment strategy for rails. And as these investments mature, we will continue to evaluate our options, of course. So expenditures through February of almost 8.2 million were approximately $483,000 below budget. Nearly all major cost categories were under the budgeted amounts with the exceptions of supplies, postage and printing expenditures, vehicle expenditures, and also library materials. So the majority of the under budget amounts were due to contractual services expenditures that were under budget from lower than uh, budgeted hosting fees for the Biblio board group purchase. Um, in total, we saved approximately um, just a little over $100,000 in that line and also um, a leg in billings for the delivery um, contractual expenditures and lower um, cataloging grant awards to date. We're, we are going to have a second round of cataloging, cataloging membership grants 
um, near the end of this fiscal year, which are expected to be significantly higher than the first round was. And the three overages um, in, the, in those expenditure categories were due primarily to the completion of the fiscal year um, 2021 budgeted laptop replacements um, earlier this year, as well as the rapidly rising fuel costs that are just beginning to decline within the past couple of days and the January portion of the group purchase um, renewal for the Communico Cloud platform. Delivery department expenditures through February of over 2.3 million were almost $92,000 below budget. Um, nearly all cost categories were under budget with the exception of vehicle expenses. And as mentioned before, fuel costs have increased rapidly over the past two months. Uh, but are now just beginning to start declining again. Um, vehicle repairs and maintenance have increased during January, February, and March due to um, two factors, both the aging of our rails fleet and some recent repairs that will be reimbursed by our insurance. So I'm going to ask for any questions at this point, and then I have some exciting, exciting news and announcement about the finance department. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Um, on the, the Rails check voucher register that you had? Yes. I just, yes. there was a couple things I didn't know what they were. So I'm just asking what they are. This the very second thing says Avila, Avila renewal for MIP maintenance, and it's five thousand over almost $6,000. What is that? That's the uh, maintenance renewal for our accounting software. For accounting software. Okay. Yes. Yes, and it's an annual amount that we pay. Um, we will be looking at um, a cloud option for our software, but we have to evaluate the cost first. And that wouldn't be implemented until well into this next fiscal year. It's something that we're thinking of uh, to put into this next fiscal year's budget. Okay, and the next thing was on the other page of that is uh, for Gregory Kronovitz, a delivery contractual service for January, 2022. What, what was he delivering? Oh, um, he's our delivery um, consultant. So he's the one that's been working with us uh, to look at our delivery options and evaluate and issue um, the RFP that we recently issued. So that's the, I believe, one of the last payments for his services. Let me see how much that was. Yes. Oh, yes, that, that was okay. for his travel and um, other oh. things that he incurred. Okay. And one last thing. I was looking at the, the vehicle uh, expenses. Um, mm -hmm. and accidents and, you know, all the different stuff you have to do to a vehicles. Um, has anybody ever looked at, um, like, renting, like, lease, leasing a vehicle fleet versus owning the vehicle fleet? Has that ever been looked at? Um, we are Mark's joining currently, the call. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and he would be better able to answer this than, than myself, but we are currently uh, renting several vehicles um, while some of our vehicles are down in Bolingbrook, and part of the repairs and maintenance are due to those vehicles, but I, let, I will let Mark fill in further with that. Okay. Uh, yeah, we did actually look into uh, leasing uh, versus owning a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, Heartland, the Heartland Library System actually moved forward with the uh, leasing of their vehicles. Uh, and in conversations with uh, uh, Susan Palmer, uh, she did state that uh, it really, they didn't realize the savings that they were anticipating. So, and that was my outcome from our investigation. When we looked into it, uh, we really, we weren't gonna really save any money, you know, over the long run. Uh, because each time I uh, received a new vehicle, uh, a new contract was actually put in place. So it's one of those perpetual things that uh, was gonna be very difficult to get out of. Uh, so it really wasn't uh, just cost justifiable for us to proceed with actually leasing the vehicles versus uh, uh, owning. Uh, I usually take the vehicles now up to about 300,000 miles. Uh, we've been getting, uh, uh, we've been buying the Ford Transits now uh, and they seem to be a little bit better uh, as far as reliable uh, than the, uh, Ford E-Series vans that we used to have before. Uh, so uh, we're still looking at those because those actually only came out in 2016. So, uh, so far they've been quite reliable, you know, in the long run. So uh, we could possibly look into leasing again, 
uh, but I'm not sure if anything has changed or not. Okay. I just wondered there, if that it had ever been looked at, you know. I, I would add to just, sorry, Sharon, just, <laughs> but for the, the vehicles, a lot of them at this point are reaching end of life. So repairs, we're also seeing a little more frequently than we might've seen in previous years. So that is one uptick that we've also noted. Yes, and the, and the repairs on the current on the current fleet that we have are so much less expensive than those sprinters that we had purchased several years ago. So they are much less expensive right now. So any other questions? If not, I'm going to take this time um, to tell you some exciting news about the finance department that I'd like to share. I'd like to introduce our new staff accountant, Elena Mendoza. She started with us this last week on March 8th, and we're all extremely excited to have her join our team. Um, she will be primarily doing the accounting for the LSAPs and replacing me in that position, but she'll also be doing some things for rail. So we're very excited. Welcome, Elena. Nice to meet you all. Thank Welcome. you. And that was all that I had. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sharon. I know how much work uh, Mr. Krieger and you did on the FEMA thing for uh, all those to for it to come through for two years. So uh, that's a uh, good thing it finally is over with, right? And so, okay. uh, uh, thank you very much, Sharon. And uh, on to uh, reports. Um, I, I have no report at this time. I, um, the committee reports were ma emailed to everybody on Wednesday. Uh, does anyone have any questions about any of the committee reports? Kyle, this is Becky, I have one question. Have we rescheduled yeah, the, the um, interview with the one candidate who was unable to make it? Uh, we have not scheduled that. Uh, we're going to work on that on Monday. Okay. But okay. we're still on track to know in April? Yes, we think uh, yes. so. We're hopeful. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. yes. Would, 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 along those lines, would we be avoiding PLA time for that interview? We will certainly keep that under consideration because okay. I think there are several people in that group that would be affected. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll make it be available for everyone, Scott, whatever we can work out. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, it's important. So I noticed on the advocacy committee report, there was some uh, mention from Jeanette about um, data gathered from schools. Shall I just, um, is there more detail coming on that? And I should just wait until it's time to reveal that data, or can you share some? Um, now that you might have shared with that advocacy committee. If we, if you don't mind waiting just a little bit, Monica, I'm actually going to have the opportunity to introduce Jeanette during the rails report. And so then maybe she could share a little bit more about that during that time. Would that be all right? Perfect. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, if not, uh, next up is, uh, Monica with the Rails Report. <laughs> Hi, uh, hello everyone. Thank you very much uh, for being here today. We wanted to note a few things that were in the Rails Report. I did want to mention some things that were not noted in the report because they happened, of course, after the deadline. Um, one of which is that some of you may have received your statement for economic interest time to file notice, which many of us received also this week. Um, one, we got we all got a notice today that that system is down currently. I assume it'll come back up soon. Um, but we did want to note that the state is expected to issue additional guidance on the changes for the statement of economic interest. Uh, Ansel Blink is preparing a draft memorandum, but they want it to be in keeping with what is happening uh, with state's notice. So we recommend that you wait a little bit of time to fill that out. Um, but we will let you know as soon as we do when we have that additional guidance and of course share it. So wanted you to be aware. Uh, we also want to let you know that yes, 
yesterday we received the fiscal year 2023 system area and per capita grant application um, that is due on June 1st so we should be sharing more with the board over April and May in terms of the the goals that are coming there but please to get that and please to to see some of the new uh, potential budget changes uh, included. Um, and as Sharon noted, we received those FEMA funds uh, this week and we were very pleased with that. And again, wanted to uh, offer our thanks to uh, Mark and to Jim and to Sharon for all the work that they did on that and making sure that those funds were available. Uh, in terms of some of the other things that are on the report, we just wanted to call your attention to, um, many of you are very aware that Rails membership is very interested in materials challenges that are happening in Illinois and elsewhere in the country right now. Uh, there is a new Pulse page for members that's up. And so if you haven't had a chance, I would encourage you to take a look at it. Um, it puts together all of the resources that we will compile as well as shares a lot of continuing education opportunities, both upcoming and recorded, so that people can have a chance to look at those. Um, those are primarily directed at uh, school and public libraries, but of course the material within them can be applicable to many, many types of libraries. So we wanted to encourage you to take a look at that and see if that has additional interest for your libraries. Um, our second round of My Library is Grants for School Libraries is now open. We're very excited about the last round of grants and all the, the exciting projects that came. And so wanted to, of course, encourage our school members uh, to take a look at those. Those grants are available for up to $5,000 and the application deadline is April 18th. So we want to encourage all our members to look at that. Um, and then of course, wanted to make sure that you are all aware of the online roundtable on data resources that's coming up uh, on April 7th. That promises to be a very interesting way to look at some of the data that is happening in the state around IPLAR uh, and some of those other uh, resources that are pulled together that might be of use to your libraries. Um, some additional information about Senate Bill 3497 Seven, which we have also referred to as the Expanded Cards for Kids Act in this room. So that did pass the Senate, as you heard in the last meeting, 52 to zero. Um, in the House, it now has traveled through committee and has moved back into the House. So we are expecting uh, the House to vote on that and we will let you know more as we know more, but uh, encouraging news on that front. And then uh, we also, I know you probably have all heard this at this point, but of course, um, Illinois Library Association Executive Director Diane Foote did announce that she is going to retire uh, at some point during this year. Uh, the ILA Executive Board uh, and ILA are beginning to talk about their process and how they'll move through um, that. But we did, again, wanted to thank Diane for her many years of great service to ILA and also for partnership with Rails. Uh, and we're very, uh, Sorry to see her go, but we know that process will go very smooth. Um, one more thing that I wanted to be able to do is introduce you to Jeanette Durecki. And here's Jeanette uh, on Zoom. She joined us at the end of uh, January as our data research assistant, primarily working on our school data project. Uh, we know we uh, told you a little bit about her last uh, month, but we wanted to give her a chance to say hello and tell you a little about herself and her project. So Jeanette, I'm gonna hand it over to you. All right, thanks, Monica. I appreciate the introduction. It's nice to finally see all of your faces and be here with you. Um, I just a little bit about myself. Um, I have a background in actually speech and hearing prior to getting my master's of information from Rutgers in 2021, joining the library world. Um, I have a concentration in data science, and that's primarily why I've joined Rails. I have a great interest in using data to kind of help improve libraries and you know just the world in general. So. I'm happy to be here working on this project. It's been really interesting so far. Um, I'm not sure how much background you know about the project. Uh, basically, I was brought on to help kind of complete the school library data for the state of Illinois, um, par partially motivated by the slide project, Keith Kralance and Deb Cockle's project about school librarians and kind of the status of that. And what we've been able to do thus far is verify that yes, about half of the library data for the state of Illinois schools is incomplete or missing, just not reported um, at the national level from the, uh, the NCES data where it's just not there. Um, in the ISBE data that we're getting, it's also very scattered and kind of incomplete. So we're trying right now to aggregate a bunch of several diff different sources to fill in the, the big picture of what's going on in Illinois school libraries. A big part of that is gonna be the certification process that's happening right now. It runs through the end of March. And we have about 66 districts so far that have sub submitted complete spreadsheets about their library positions and staff. So we're hoping that that number is going to increase because 
I'm sure as you know, 66 is not really a lot. You know, we have hundreds of districts in the state. So we're hoping that that number will increase drastically in the next couple of weeks. Um, as far as an update to the advocacy committee, I will be at the meeting in April, at April 14th, giving a more detailed update at that meeting. We'll, like I said, we'll have that certification data at that point. So we're hoping that we'll be able to give you a better picture of where we stand. Um, we're currently collaborating with the State Library, um, Illinois Heartland Library System, as well as Dominican University. They've got a project about school libraries that they're doing to kind of see how we can get as much data as possible. We're running into a few little speed bumps here and there with access. You know, there's only so much you can find widely available online. And, you know, understandably so, there's a lot of privacy considerations around, you know, employee data and things like that. So um, some people at the Illinois State Board of Education have made it known that they're likely going to remove some of their public data sets from their website because of privacy rights. So it'll be a little bit more difficult for us to get that, take a few more steps maybe. Um, we're the another big thing that we're looking at right now, and then I'll um, let you move on to other parts of the meeting, but uh, just to give you an idea of where this is going, once the data collection is kind of completed, you know, we're looking at how to kind of keep this going forward. Where are we going to store this data? Who's going to have access to it? And who will be updating it? Um, one thing we've found is we're pulling data from so many different sources that the interoperability is a challenge. So it would be quite a, a task for someone to keep doing that on an ongoing basis. So we're looking at making this the easiest system possible to keep the library information up to date. So we don't end up with just like a snapshot in time of 2022, what the school library status was. We'd like to be able to keep this current moving forward. So we're investigating, you know, database options, uh, online web interface options and things like that going forward. So you can all see Jeanette's really hit the ground running as she's come on board with Rails. Any questions for Jeanette? Yeah, I'm happy to Thank answer so anything much. that you might have. I, I, or you can always shoot me an email as well. And I know for anybody who's interested, her joining us at the advocacy meeting, I think in April, we'll also share some additional information as she noted because of the, we'll have that certification data. So, so thank you so much for sharing that, uh, Jeanette. And I know everybody's very interested in this project. We thank you so much for, for your support of it. No, thank you. Happy to be uh, part of it. Before uh, we open it up for questions, just wanted to call your attention to a couple of exciting developments. One uh, is around Find More Illinois. So I know you all are aware of the Find More Illinois project, uh, but we are continuing to see Find More growing. Uh, in your packet, it listed all of the libraries that have come on board uh, in the last month, including uh, the Pinnacle Library Cooperative and six libraries there, some of which are represented by members of this board. So we're very excited about how Find More is growing and moving forward, uh, and, and we encourage you to pay attention uh, to some of those changes as they continue to be. So, any questions for me about the Rails report or anything else uh, that you saw on the report today? Just a couple things. I just wanted to first off say, did you enjoy putting this together with the new strategic plan under? <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly did. <laughs> Yes, it's really fun to see uh, the strategic goals that we have here and the ways the work that Rails is doing aligns with that. And I think, especially as we move into the Arian per capita process and then have those action goals lined up with measures and metrics, this is like the stuff that gets us going sometimes. So yes. It's read so coherently based on like what we're talking about. So I was just like, just, oh, this is so great to read it this way. So thank you for that. And I'm glad it's working out well. And just one other thing I wanted to, um, I'm glad you brought up materials challenges and highlighted that because it's obviously a really big complicated issue. Mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of add another kind of related piece to that that I think we need to just kind of be situationally aware of, which is that in academic libraries, yeah, we do get materials challenges, but what we're seeing right now actually in some member libraries is colleges that are putting really strict internet filters on their computers mm. in public spaces and even in, in some classrooms and stuff. And there are some, some librarians and other staff on the campuses that are trying to negotiate with their college leadership about how to how to have that conversation about um, censorship really and academic freedom and freedom to read and everything else that comes with it. So definitely not exactly the same peg, but it's kind of on the same board, I think. So, and when we're talking about maybe being a resource for our mm -hmm. members, I think it would be really helpful if Rails 
was looking at cultivating some um, helpful guidance on how to have those conversations, maybe even host a, a conversation if we have a, if there's an expert or somebody that we can identify that can, you know, that can speak to the group, I think that would be valued. That's really interesting and not something that we've heard a lot about. So we really appreciate you bringing that yeah. to our attention. I don't know if it's widespread, but I know of some very isolated cases. And then when questions went out to listservs, you know, you get a smattering of people who are like, oh, we have filters kind of like that too. So people are kind of living with it and mm -hmm. either it's impacted or not impacting their work, but it's definitely, it's happening. So thank you so much yeah. for sharing that, Jennifer. We will definitely look at that and see Good. what Rails can do to help. I have just one other question about the um, the challenge, the materials challenges pulse page. Um, is it the goal, definitely not to you know redo what OIF already does, but is it the goal to track challenges or just be kind of like a resource page? Um, pulse page make makes it sort of seem like you're going to track things, but it, is it really just like a a landing spot for information about challenges? Yeah, great question, Monica. Uh, at this point, we are not tracking challenges, although there are several other organizations like OIF who do do that work. Um, the Pulse page is uh, an expansion of the other pages uh, that we have that focus specifically on topics that our libraries have said that they were very interested in. So it's a way for us to offer guidance or continuing education or a place for it to be kind of a one-stop shop on certain issues. And it appears right at the top of the Rails page. So when you go to the railslibraries.info, it's those blue boxes that appear right at the top and those that have been most recently updated appear in the top four. Um, so you will, if you look at it today, you'll see materials challenges and COVID-19 right up there uh, at the top. And we have several other topics that we are constantly adding to just based on what's happening uh, in the Rails membership area. Any other questions on the Rails report for today? Pass it back to you, Tom. Okay, no other questions. Thank you, Monica. Um, <laughs> that was a very interesting report. Uh, thank you. Uh, now on to Jessica with the Rail Service of the Month report, uh, Explore More Illinois. Jessica? Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, Are you seeing um, Explore More Illinois online cultural and recreation pass? Okay, great. Yes, we are. Um, okay, great. I just wanted to make sure before I started. Um, so thanks so much for having me this month. My name is Jessica Barnes. I'm the special projects librarian here at Rails, and I'll be talking about Explore More Illinois, which is Rails online cultural and recreation pass. Um, Explore More Illinois was created after member libraries reached out to us asking for an alternative to existing museum pass programs that were available for public libraries. So unlike other programs, Explore More Illinois is 100% online, um, which makes it really convenient for both uh, patrons and staff members. Um, patrons can access um, the Illinois, uh, Explore More Illinois software 24-7 from anywhere with um, internet and they can make reservations to the attractions from the comfort of their own home. Um, Explore More Illinois also provides offers across the state. So it's not just in Chicagoland, like some of the existing museum pass programs um, before we started. Um, we have a presence in Peoria, Springfield and Rockford. And we also just recently added three attractions in Wisconsin and we're looking to expand throughout the Midwest. And finally, Rails covers the cost of Explore More Illinois for our members, which allows all public libraries to join no matter what their budget is. Um, Explore More Illinois launched on April 1st, 2019 with 19 attractions and about 50 libraries. In March 2020, we had 40 attractions and 250 libraries enrolled in the program. In mid-March 2020, we sent an email to our library saying the program would be shut down for two weeks. Um, but we did not restart Explore More Illinois until April 1st, 2021. So we definitely misjudged that, um, but who knew what was gonna happen in the world <laughs> um, in mid-March, 2020. Um, however, we were busy during our almost one year hiatus. During the height of the shutdown, I curated a Rails webpage with free online cultural performances and activities for our member libraries to share with their patrons. 
we revamped our Explore More Illinois website and added Rails and Illinois Heartland Library System Libraries. Um, right now, 321 Rails libraries and 83 IHLS libraries have joined Explore More Illinois. Attractions have been our biggest challenge during the last year. There's been a lot of uncertainty. Museums have required advanced registrations and limited admission numbers. Most performing arts organizations were shut down completely. However, as of this week, we are back up to 40 attractions, which is exactly the number that we were at when we shut down in March 2020. Um, we're excited to have added two minor and college league baseball teams for this summer, and we're talking to other teams as well. I had a meeting with a women's professional sports team in Chicago yesterday, and we're really optimistic about them joining very soon. Harris Theater in Chicago has reopened to live performances, and they have $5 tickets for shows in March and April. So I encourage all of you to check out that offer um, if you're interested in attending. Um, we also have seasonal attractions that will be starting in May. So we'll be adding attractions um, very soon. Things like um, Anderson Japanese Gardens in Rockford that doesn't open until later this spring. And we also have several park district programs um, and venues that don't open until like later Memorial Day and in the summer. Other exciting news on the attraction front is our contest, which is sponsored by the Quipu Group, the software company behind Explore More Illinois. Libraries can submit a potential attraction, and if that attraction ends up joining Explore More Illinois, they receive an entry for a raffle to win lunch for their staff. Um, we've received 40 entries so far, and I've really been busy the last couple of weeks contacting ballet companies, outdoor adventure centers, symphony orchestras, museums, and zoos, and I'm really excited about the response that um, the contest has generated. Finally, our last big project of the spring is our community college pilot program. Again, this request came straight from our membership. So we're currently working with Carly and Illinois Central College in Peoria to open up Explore More Illinois to community college students, faculty, and staff. This will open up Explore More Illinois to a new audience and to communities that may be unserved by public libraries. Um, the software is up and running right now for ICC. They're just working on marketing and we're hoping in the next couple of weeks um, their community will start being um, able to take advantage of the offers and make reservations. In addition, community colleges can also provide us with additional attractions. Um, until I started doing the research, I was unaware of the amazing performing arts centers, galleries, gardens, planetariums, and athletic facilities community colleges in Illinois offer. Um, I have a phone call scheduled with the director of the Performing Arts Center at ICC next week. So I think this is gonna be a win-win for all of us. Um, I'm really excited about the future of Explore More Illinois. Um, it's, I, I couldn't imagine the last couple of years, but um, I think we're coming back strong and I can't wait to see what we're gonna be like by the end of the year. Um, please share this resource with people in your community. I'm available for staff trainings, network group meetings, and phone calls to talk about the program. If you know contacts at potential attractions, please let me know. Knowing a contact at an attraction is crucial in getting them to sign with Explore More Illinois. And I'd be happy to send your contacts any information about the program. Um, my contact information is at the bottom of the talking points. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, and of course you can reach me through Rails as well. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have about Explore More. I just want to thank you. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, well, I'm actually not <laughs> So as somebody who used to have to stop altercations between patrons lining up at the door to get their zoo pass at 8.59 when we opened, because I was at a library that was next to the zoo. Um, this is so much better. <laughs> I mean- I'm so glad to hear that. Um, I. Um, oh, oh, it was, I it was horror bad. stories, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, and people want us to save them, and we're like, we can't, and then they're, uh, yeah, so they Great. come up with sob stories on why they needed the pass, so thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. That is, I'm sorry that that happened to you, but I'm really glad that we have found an alternative. <laughs> Jessica, this is Hallie. Do you know, is it open to specialized libraries, too? Can I so not, that? Yeah, right now it's not. So we, we have gotten the from <laughs> specials and from schools. Um, we are just sticking to the pilot with the community colleges first. But like I said, um, the 
why we're doing the pilot with community colleges is hearing from our members. So I will definitely make sure that there's an interest from specials and we'll see what happens in the future. It's not to say that that will never be open to special or school libraries, but uh, we're just trying to focus on the next uh, library type in, in this round of pilots and we'll see what happens in the future. Totally understandable. Thank you. Okay, and thanks. Jessica, some of that is due to the technological limitations, right? Yeah. In terms of the integration with the Quipu software. Yeah, correct? there's a lot of different things. Um, it, it would be, we would have to talk about it with specials, but you know, just the way that we authenticate the cards and things, um, it might be a challenge, but I will definitely keep in mind that there is interest from the special libraries um, as well. Thank you. Sure. And I just wanted to thank you for doing the pilot with the community colleges. I, I know I mentioned that in one of the presentations and if you heard it from others, I'm just glad that that message came through. And I recognize Great. what you're saying about the technology because when we're talking about you know, our shared catalog with the academic libraries, you know, we don't really have boutique groups within the catalog. So I know that that is not a small task, what you're talking yeah. about to just carve off some members of the consortium. So I yeah. really appreciate you working it through. Oh, no problem. Um, you know, the technology, there were some, you know, differences than working with publics, um, but it's also a lot of policies and procedures. Um, academic libraries are just That's set up great. differently than publics. And so we're just working, it's been great to work with ICC and Carly. They've been really great partners on this. Um, so we're just working out those like slight differences. Um, and then, you know, once we get everything worked out with ICC, what we're hoping is maybe we'll, we'll do one more library this fall. Um, and then we can start adding additional libraries on an ongoing basis um, through the community college systems. Yeah. So good to hear. Thank you. Sure. Jessica, are all attractions available to all library members so, or are some, are, are, there, are there some that are geared? I would say 99% of our offers are available to everyone. Um, actually though, I will just with the board, um, our most popular attraction last year was the Peoria Riverfront Museum. Um, it was an existing museum pass program that was available to Peoria County libraries and then the libraries bordering Peoria County. Um, when they found out about Explore More Illinois, they switched from a paper pass program into our program. But the only libraries that are eligible for it are Peoria counties and the surrounding counties. So when you log in, if you are a member of a library that is in Peoria County or the surrounding counties, you will see the offer. If your library is not in one of those counties, you don't see the offer. So it's not like you know perhaps that that offer is available to you. You just won't even see it and you're not eligible to, um, to make the reservation. Um, right now, that is the only, I, I should take that back. There's one other um, uh, past that uh, they've excluded there's three counties in um, three libraries in their county, and they've excluded those libraries because they already get free passes. Um, like it's already free for their residents in that county. So they've excluded those libraries, and then it's for everyone else. So everything else, though, is available to everyone. So yeah. I hope that I hope that answers it. I just wanted to point out uh, the work that Jessica did in growing the Explore More program throughout the pandemic was really inspiring to me. It was really one example of the real staff kind of looking at a really strange situation in the pandemic and trying to figure out how to innovate with that. And so the growth that happened in terms of the libraries, both through Rails and IHLS that came on board the program, even while many of the attractions themselves were closed, allowed those libraries to come on board and have us have the time to onboard them. Uh, and now as these attractions are opening, we have a bigger program. So a lot yeah. of interesting growth that happened during that period. Yeah, it's actually allowed us to focus more on attractions right now because um, we have such a high percentage of libraries that are participating. So it was... Not to say that I wanted that downtime, I certainly did, none of us did, um, but it did allow me to do a lot of uh, the library work and now we can focus on the attractions and growing that part of the program. I have kind of a silly question, I guess. 100% uh, of my knowledge about this program is from the library side handing out the passes. I've never actually used it myself. So when they, when they show up at one of the attractions with the passes, do they have to jump through any hoops there like, prove who they are or show a library card or they just show the pass and get in? Yeah, typically you'll just show, um, You can most attractions do not require a printed pass. You can just show it on your phone 
um, or your tablet. Um, sometimes they'll ask for an ID just to make sure that the reservation and the person there match, um, but that um, is not a requirement at all places. Um, we do suggest that people bring an ID just in case someone checks. Um, so really that's the only, um, the only thing that you need to bring to the attraction that day. A few of our attractions are still requiring advanced registration, and that's clearly labeled when you log into Explore More. So if you do have to make advanced reservations, we usually have a link um, directly there, and we let our patrons know if there's any kind of additional requirements that they have to do. Um, in fact, like Chicago Children's Museum is requiring advanced registration still, but if you are Explore More Illinois member, you don't have to make um, an advanced registration. You can just come in with your pass, day of, decide that you wanna go. And like, that's a really great feature of making your reservation through Explore More Illinois. So there's actually like perks, which is great. Yeah. Just one more question, Jessica. Um, I know sure. Anderson Garden in um, in Rockford is one of the most popular, is one of a popular, and I'm logged on right now and I'm not seeing it. Yeah, so um, you can only make reservations two months in advance in Explore More and their offer starts June 1st. So April 1st, you should be able to see Anderson Japanese Garden um, and then you can make that reservation <laughs> on April 1st. So mark your calendar and then you'll see it, yeah. Any other questions for Jessica? Okay, I, uh, Kendall was talking about this earlier today. Uh, Peoria does have the most affordable housing in the US right now. So if you wanna come down and visit, buy a house and visit the Riverfront Museum, you're, you're fully welcome. <laughs> you can also get free ice skates at the ice arena. So if you make, um, if you go to Open Skate with Explore More, you can go ice skating at Owen Center, so yeah. I, I, I feel like this has made Jessica into like the tour guide for Illinois, too, right? <laughs> I really, um, so actually a few rail staff and I have said we have to do a road trip this summer <laughs> and go to all these places that are, yeah. um, like that are offered. It'd be so much fun to do kind of like a photo tour of all of these really cool places. You should get like a shout out in like that Illinois, like the travel guide, like, <laughs> you know, like come see these places. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much, Jessica. That thank was you. very informative. Uh, now we hear from the State Library. Uh, Gwen, I mean, the Abe Lincoln uh, Museum was on the list for Explore More Illinois. So uh, everybody can come down to Springfield. It's, it's a wonderful uh, place. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, Are you ready, Tom? You bet. We're All right. Good ready. afternoon, everybody. My name is Gwen Harrison and I work at the State Library. I'm a network youth um, um, and diversity consultant. So here goes the report. Project Next Generation grant applications are due March 30th. These grants for public libraries allow for the establishment of educational programs and hiring a mentor or mentors to work specifically with middle to high school programs with high school students. Uh, from STEM to exploring careers, immersive programs may be planned to not only educate and involve students in technology uh, related projects, but also to promote character development and to improve personal skills such as goal setting or to build self-confidence. Public Library Construct Construction um, Act grant applications are due April 15th. Um, this grant program assists public libraries with construction costs in their facilities. And if you have more questions about this, I urge you to contact Mark Schaefer. The Public Library Per Capita and Equalization Aid Grant applications are currently being processed. Award letters were recently mailed to um, school districts for the school district library grant. From fiscal year 22 appropriations, approved by the General Assembly, the governor and the governor, school library grants were based on a formula of 0.885 cents per student with a minimum grant award of $850. The school district library grant is used to support the services and programs of district libraries programs. Um, let's see here, now this one's really good. Libraries applying for fiscal year 23 grants that are funded with federal funds may receive an email requesting their agency's unique 
Entity Identifier, or UEI, if it is not currently on file at the Illinois State Library. Since 1998, the federal government, including the Institute of Museum and Library Services, has used a Dunn and Brad, Bradstreet number or Dunn's number to identify and validate agencies receiving grant, uh, federal grant funds, including LSTA monies, Library Services and Technology Act monies. The UEI provided through SAM.gov is positioned to take the place of the Dunn's starting in April, 2022. If your library is registered in SAM.gov, a UEI has already been assigned to your agency. For those agencies not registered in SAM.gov, their website offers an option to just obtain a UEI without going through the full certification process. The UEI will be required for libraries receiving federal funds, such as the LSTA from the State Library. The National Library Service, and by extension, the Talking Book and Braille Service in Illinois, has updated its eligibility standards. While children and adults with a reading disability have previously qualified for services, they were, they were required to have a medical doctor as the certifying authority for eligibility. The change in standards has expanded, has an expanded list of professionals who may certify eligibility for services to include certified psychologists, educators, certified reading specialist and school psychologist. This is really good news for parents and educators who are seeking additional support services for students who have reading disabilities. Um, entry forms are now available for the 18th annual Illinois Emerging Writers Competition, Gwendolyn Brooks Poetry Award. The competition was named um, after the late Pulitzer Prize winning Illinois Poet Laureate Gwendolyn Brooks and is co-sponsored by the Illinois Center for the Book and the Illinois Poet Laureate Angela Jackson. Uh, this competition is open to Illinois residents ages 18 and over. Entries must be postmarked by June 30th, 20, uh, 2022, and there are cash prizes. And there's more information on our website under the Illinois Center for the Book if you're interested in knowing more about this. We also urge you to watch for e-news from the Illinois State Library with more details about these and many more topics. Um, let's see here. Oh, and I just wanted to add, I had the opportunity to uh, um, uh, sit in on a training that was offered by RELS um, titled How to Be an Upstander. And I thought it was an excellent, excellent training. And I just wanna thank RELS for doing these kinds of training. And I, I look forward to uh, engaging in more trainings along these lines. So thank you. And if you have any questions, um, now's the time. I want to thank you for your comment about the upstander training, Gwen, and also to make sure that the board knows that that training was actually recommended by our EDI board committee. That was one of the things that came out of that board committee um, and series has, has also been very popular. So Again, we want to thank the the board for the board committee for recommending that work, and and we're very pleased uh, to see that work moving forward too. Okay, thank you. Okay, any questions for Gwen? Okay, Gwen, thank you very much for the report today, and uh, I know that Project Next Generation is a great program. I know you have a lot of people uh, applying for that. We do. Uh, now it's on to board development. Uh, uh, moving on to Hallie and Dan with uh, Specialized Libraries, Trends and Challenges. Uh, Hallie or Dan want to take over? Hi, good afternoon, Hi. Hallie. Uh, I'll jump in here if that's okay with you. Yep, that's fabulous. All right. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, okay, you should be able to see our slides. That look okay? Yes. 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 Wonderful. Okay. So uh, thank you for having us. Um, I'm Dan Bostrom, Rails Member Engagement uh, Manager, and um, I'm pleased to be collaborating today with Hallie um, on the topic of specialized libraries and especially the trends and the challenges that, um, that we're seeing. Um, Hallie. How is a much more uh, detailed look at that particular situation. I'm not a specialized librarian, 
Um, I, I just uh, am a passionate observer. So, um, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, so I'm going to give a little, just a little bit of a um, overview of the situation as I see it. Um, and then Hallie's going to give you a much more zoomed in perspective. And she'll talk about what she sees on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, first, I want to apologize to all of you who uh, are on the, whoops, what did I do? Somehow I zoomed in here. There we go. Okay, so uh, I apologize to all of you who are on the Rails Board Advocacy Committee. Uh, you've seen some of these slides already. So, um, so I, I, uh, this is a little bit of a, this is a little bit of a rehash, but, um, but I think it's worth talking about because it's pretty serious. Um, so, you know, my perspective uh, is is from the uh, is from the SLA Illinois uh, perspective because uh, when I joined Rails, one of the first uh, challenges that uh, my uh, su supervisor Mary. Mary Witt gave me was to kind of integrate myself into the specialized library community and learn more about it. So I joined SLA, um, and and as I was arriving in 2018, uh, the association was already into a pretty enormous slide downward, um, and uh, the statistics are pretty uh, are, are pretty surprising. So since 2010, the organization has lost 25% of its membership, um, and uh, they've lost. I'm sorry, has lost 25% of its membership. Uh, between 2017 and 2021, and 70% of its membership since 20 uh, since 2010. So, you know, as as a consequence of uh, that decline in membership, um, you know, this is a dues collecting organization. So, uh, they've seen a huge drop in revenue, and it's really been um, it's it's been a it's been a really difficult time for them. Um, at this point, we're starting to see big losses in kind of local participation. Uh, the Wisconsin chapter just recently disbanded. They couldn't take any. They couldn't get anyone to take board positions. Um, we we on the Illinois level, we've seen a lot of the same thing. Uh, I'm the SLA Illinois president this year, and uh, we have two open board positions that have just been unable to be filled uh, because we can't really find people to step up and take them. So uh, there's been a lot of mergers. There's been a lot of loss of uh, local control. But um, you know, we're we're really seeing kind of the pain at that national level. Um, you know, in terms of rails, uh, I, I can I can tell you that uh, you know, in our in terms of our membership, we lose about four specialized libraries per year. Um, so these these numbers that I'm showing you right now, they come directly from um, from our uh, from the annual report that we submit to the Illinois State Library. Um, it's a slower slide um, that, than than uh, than SLA, as you can probably see, um, mostly because you know they don't pay anything to be part of rails. Um, it, but, you know, anecdotally, I'll just tell you that, uh, especially during certification, which we're in right now, um, you know, we always see, we see libraries dropping um, and, and we run into the situation where, you know, there's no one, there's no library in the building. Um, no one is replacing them. The library is slowly being phased out. Uh, the physical space is, is closed, um, that sort of thing. So it, it happens everywhere. Um, and, and we do see it on, on the local level here in Illinois. And there's a ton of reasons for this. I could I could I could get I could get very granular into why this happens. Um, but but I'm I'm not going to get too involved in that. Uh, I just want to sort of focus on on kind of the trends uh, in in the industry for now. Um, but um, uh, but but we can talk about that more if you if you want to at the end. So um, I, I came up with three trends, and these are just three directions that I sort of see the field moving. Uh, the first one is, is ROI, uh, or kind of just demonstrating value. So um, you know, when we were doing when when we were doing our specialized library spotlights, I actually talked to a, a law librarian um, who bills for his time. So he keeps track of hours uh, to show how much he value how much value he brings to his case. Um, and I can tell you that not a lot of school, academic, or public librarians do that. So, you know, they, they have to really make the case every single day about what their value is to the organization. Um, it's all about dollars saved, value returned. Um, you know, when I go to SLA conferences, I'll tell you that uh, in the past, this has been a huge topic. People really looking for ideas on how to present um, what they do in terms of, uh, you know, quantifiable data. Um, and there's someone actually who's a specialist in this field. Uh, her name is Mary Ellen Bates. She's a special library consultant. Um, and you know, if you actually if you look at the specialized library portion of the My Library Is website, you can see an article that Mary Ellen wrote, and it's really great. Um, she talks about you know creating cheat sheets um, for for specialized librarians to kind of make uh, to make the library work stand out, to make to make the work stand out in terms of uh, the the organization. 
and uh, in the community that they serve. Um, you know, she talks about creating elevator speeches, making clear distinctions about what work is performed in the library and how it saves the organization money. Um, so, so this is really, this has been a huge focus. I mean, this is advocacy for them. They have to, they have to kind of uh, quantify the advocacy uh, for, for, for their libraries. Uh, another another trend that uh, that we see is the shift to digital document delivery and digital platforms. This has really accelerated during COVID uh, over the last two years. So I had a conversation um, a couple weeks ago with a librarian from a nonprofit organization, and she said that before the pandemic, one of the things that her staff would do at the library was to distribute papers to people in in their offices, uh, which is which is kind of funny. Um, but that I mean, obviously that totally went away from uh, during the pandemic and. Uh, you know, she said she said she spent a ton of time negotiating with the uh, with newspaper companies to sort of figure out a way that they, she could distribute the online versions and make people transition to that uh, digital document delivery. So, you know, uh, specialized libraries don't participate in, in in interlibrary loan of physical materials very often, but they do a lot of interlibrary loan digitally, um, and, and they have to they have to figure out ways to quote unquote lend documents um, to the to their users to the people that uh, that they are serving. Um, so, you know, the physical space is kind of is going away in a lot of cases. That's kind of why we lose them as Rails members. Once that physical space uh, has has gone, um, you know, there's no longer really a library. Um, and, you know, their titles change a lot of times. Um, they move away from that library title. That you've, we've already seen that a lot. I, don't, I think a lot of people in SLA, honestly, don't have librarian in their title. Um, and you can say it's a shame, but it's, it's really, it's a business decision. And it's, uh, you know, for each individual organization, that is something that they kind of have to, have to decide for themselves. Um, so this is the third and, and final um, trend that, that we're seeing. It ties really heavily into the last one. So uh, with the move to digital resources, a lot of libraries have to accumulate um, this new skill, and the new skill is negotiation. Um, so as my colleague Layla Heath will tell you, uh, buying physical books and, and licensing e-content are two very different things. Um, and, and, this, and the skill that it takes to, to purchase e-content and to bring it to a lot of people, bring it to users, um, it, it's very detailed. I mean, you really have to think a, a lot of ways, like, you know, um, how long do we have the resources for? Um, how are we going to get them to our users? Uh, you know, what, are, what, are the, what is the contract language behind all of this? Um, so there's a lot, of, lot to think about. And, and, you know, most librarians are not trained negotiators, but I can tell you that the vendors who sell it to them, they are trained negotiators. Um, so once, you know, um, so finding the right database package, um, ebook platform, Platform. It can be very tricky, um, and, and, and so this has uh, also been a huge topic uh, that, that has come up at, at SLA conferences that I've attended. So um, that's kind of just my real high overview of, of, the, uh, of the industry, and at this point, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Hallie, um, who will talk a little bit more uh, about what a specialized library does day to day. Um, so Hallie, I, I'm turning it over to you, and oops, you know what? Slides did not get in there. Sorry about that. Hold on one second. If you want to go ahead and start, that's exciting anyway. And you can keep the one up. It's just I like pictures that. of the library. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> yeah, Dan, I wouldn't worry about it. If you could find the one with the pictures of the library, that would be great. If not, it's in the board packet. Is it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Look at your board packet. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Dan. And I want to thank Dan too for being such a strong advocate for special libraries and being so actively involved with SLA and SLA Illinois. I just cannot thank you enough for that. Um, as Dan was talking about the trends that are face facing specialized libraries now, um, as you can see, it, we are in dire straits as a genre, so to speak. Um, we are incredibly specialized even amongst ourselves. So as you can see from Dan's the statistics Dan presented, we have a hard time even supporting each other. I, you know what I mean? So for Rails, I really appreciate how Rails deeply tries to support special libraries. But as you can see, we, we even have a hard time finding that niche ourselves, much less from a larger organization. So I really commend Rails for, for doing what you have done and reaching out. And I think we need to continue to do that and continue to brainstorm and continue to find new ways to support specials and in specialized libraries within our area. 
um, it, it is an uphill battle, even amongst ourselves, it's an uphill battle. So, um, you know, as most of you know, you know, like I was just saying, specialized libraries are incredibly specialized amongst ourselves. We have different funding mechanisms, different missions, different audiences, different governance um, bodies. Um, I'm going to be sharing my perspective as a county law library. We are supported through civil filing fees and we are open to the public. Um, the King County Law Library, we have a very small staff, which is very common amongst special libraries, which is one of the the challenges for special libraries being involved at a larger scale in a lot of things. Um, I'm lucky we're for, for a special library. We have three full-time staff, myself, a librarian, an LTA, and then um, we also have an Illinois Justice Corps fellow, which has been assigned to our courthouse, which we oversee, which is fabulous. Uh, Illinois Justice Corps is an offshoot of AmeriCorps. And they have um, fellows that come into the, the courthouses and, and sort of act as, for lack of a better term, a Walmart reader for the, for this, for the court system to help people uh, feel a little bit more comfortable and things like that. Um, we have our primary mission um, is to support our 530 plus, 30,000 plus residents in Kane County. But like all public libraries, we do support everybody. We do not limit our services to just our county. They're just our first priority. Um, so that being said, um, Dan had talked about the return on investment. It, you all know, we all need to establish our return on investment. That is crucial for all libraries, but especially for specials in the sense that we, a lot of us are, are um, for profits. So we really have to show how we are adding to that bottom line for, for the larger corporation or business. I'm lucky I do not have to do that necessarily in terms of dollar amounts uh, strictly, but I do have to do that in terms of right now, we're in a land grab for lack of a better term. <laughs> I have a very large space within the courthouse and we are now putting judges and staff attorneys and things like that, literally in closets. So I am constantly having to prove or, or um, justify myself to the county board and to the other elected officials why it is so important for the library to have space within the courthouse for networking purposes, for a neutral area, for self-represented litigants, for space for Zoom court, I mean, it is, it is a constant, well, look at all the space they have. They don't need books anymore. I'm like, well, okay, I am looking at removing some of the books and the stacks, but we also need the, that space for computers, for people to attend Zoom court within the courthouse, for the, the networking meetings amongst the attorneys, for them to meet with, with clients. Um, so there's always that return on investment that we're uh, trying to prove. We also try to run... Um, a Boy Scout Law Merit Badge Day annually, a family reading night with the judges annually. We really try to create programming that pulls in the general public and really teaches them and helps involve them in the court system in a more positive manner. Most people don't come to the courthouse for anything fun. I mean, adoptions, that's it. You know, <laughs> any other reason you're there, it is not fun. <laughs> so we try to create those um, that programming that people can come into the courthouse in a positive or in a positive setting and really meet the judges, meet, you know, the sheriff, you know, pet the sheriff's dog, you know, things of that nature and, and really learn about the system and, and the, the personal side of the system. Um, uh, giving back to the public, we also partner with the King County Bar Association and Gilborn Public Library. Um, we're looking to expand into other libraries as well. Um, I just talked to Stephen. I just lost his last name. The uh, one of the uh, reference managers at Poplar Poplar oh. Poplar Creek. Yeah, Poplar Creek. Yeah, Chris. Can you say? Yeah. Um, about possibly they they're looking at developing a lawyer in the library program. Scott, I think you have one too, sort of. Yeah, in Will County. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that that's another way we really try to bring our services into our communities and also have the community come in. We have two programs right now physically in the law library where we have attorneys volunteer their time to answer questions. So you do a lawyer in library and you do it different counties, right? Through the county library, you have it. Yeah. I'm just thinking like it's time to put in pre uh, presentations for ILA. I would love as a trustee and a librarian to go to a program at ILA about 
lawyer in the library. That's a good one. Because okay. I'm in Cook County. Yeah. So I would love if we could have lawyer in the library at one of our libraries. If anybody <laughs> wants to work, like I just. I will add that to my list. I mean, yes. that would help with everything. <laughs> that's something I know a lot of people would want to go to. Yeah, I know there was a, um, um, somebody from the administrative office of the Illinois courts put in a program proposal for Zoom court, how to do Zoom court. Right, that's libraries. something we've been have, helping people with as well, yeah. Yeah, and unfortunately that programming, just based on the other programs that were submitted, just did not make it this time. But it's definitely, we do want to become more involved at the ILA level, you know, and really push out the services. That would, I mean, I, I'm not on the committee this year, but I would love to see that. Oh, I'm on it. Everybody and even on the if, committee listening. Even if it doesn't become an ILA program, I'm more than willing. That could be a rail library. I mean, that's, Good. I would, yeah. I'm going to do it through rails. I, mean, I have a lot of friends classes. I'm thinking of whose libraries could really, really use this. I'm on it. Just, yeah, give me a call. <laughs> Joe, give her trip. a call. <laughs> <laughs> I will road trip. Um, other ways we help establish our return on investment is we have just, especially since the pandemic, I think we'd always been this like silent partner within the court system. And since the pandemic, the onslaught of self-represented litigants that have no idea what is going on has just been tremendous. So we have really stepped up to the plate and developed a lot of PR materials, make sure everything's current and accurate at all times on the websites, things of that nature, um, editing documents um, for the different departments and agencies, creating documents for the different departments and agencies, because I think, um, this would be shocking, but as a government entity, we often, we know how to do it. So, you know, like one of the judges just put out a document to the general public about how well you need to, to, to create a 28 day notice, and then you need to get it into your file, and then you need to make sure you have a, a contact date. And people are like, oh, I don't know what that is, <laughs> you know, so, so we put that into more layman's terms, we do step by steps. So that's, and the other departments are really starting to realize how much that helps them mm -hmm. when we create documents that are much more user-friendly to the general public. It cuts down on the phone calls and the questions and the confusion in the courtrooms. So they're really starting to see what that return on investment. So in that sense, the pandemic has been very good to us. Um, Dan also mentioned the shift to digital platforms. Um, Zoom court, hello. <laughs> We're doing, that's, a lot of our work right now is making sure people get on Zoom court correctly, accurately. They know where they're supposed to be. A lot of the courts are going hybrid. Um, sometimes the judges are doing Zoom court, then other hours they're doing in person. People get confused. They're not sure where they're supposed to be. Um, so we're helping dramatically with that. Um, something about the shift to digital platforms too is that the whole idea, and I've, I've Every library deals with this. Everybody just thinks, well, it's online. It's, everything's online. Why do you need a book? Everything's free. If it's online, it must be free. And there's that whole education component that we have to do with our stakeholders um, and elected officials about, no, not everything is available online. No, if it is online, it does not make it free <laughs> by a long shot. <laughs> um, so we really have those deep conversations. Um, there's also the issue that the infrastructure. People don't think about the infrastructure that the courthouse has had internet go down. We've had our electricity go down. The courts do not stop. They keep going. They turn on flashlights. They have emergency lights. The trial continues whether the attorneys can get to their Lexus account or not. So I also try to sort of play that into our discussions of, I think, digital complements. Print is my own personal philosophy. It does not replace print. So there's some things you can do digitally, other things you really always need to still have in print. So that's definitely a conversation that I'm continuing to have uh, with, with my stakeholders. Um, Dan also talked about vendor negotiations. I have an MLIS from a long time ago. Um, I do not have an IT degree. <laughs> I do not have a CPA license. I don't have anything in negotiating. So, and as I mentioned earlier, special libraries, there's often one librarian or two or three. So not only are you doing your daily tasks, 
you know, trying to upkeep your return on investment, all that stuff. But then you're trying to figure out the IT background. And a lot of us have stronger, like I, you know, I work with the county IT department. They have no idea about card catalogs online and how, you know what I mean? How the different vendors work with each other. And that's like so out of their range. So even if you do have IT support, they don't understand the philosophy or the goals behind what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So, and you're vying for their support along with everybody else in your organization. So I'm, I'm guessing it's a lot like the community colleges and the academics that you're really vying for that support from a, a lot of different other departments. So that's definitely something that we struggle with a lot. Um, a lot. <laughs> there are a lot of things I would love to do and move forward with, but we just don't have the IT support for it. Um, not being an IT person myself, I know just enough to break things. So, <laughs> um, and then I just want to talk a little bit too about Rails. And I mean, again, Rails is just, it is a crime if you are not a member of mail rails i think um especially as a special library because we are small staff we often are underfunded we're forgotten about we do not have that professional support other people that understand our mission our goals um within the or larger organization usually so rails is just a phenomenal networking opportunity for us to see how other libraries are doing things to get that professional uh, support and encouragement. And um, I think too, we push a lot out to um, the other library types as well. We're phenomenal collaborators. Um, we, we work well in terms of, you know, having schools come in and do tours and mock trials and things of that nature, business law classes, law enforcement. We, we support all those types of um, academic and programming. Um, so Rails, I think just, I, I encourage everybody to be a member of Rails, just, just for the networking opportunities and the, the purchasing opportunities. And it, it's just a phenomenal, phenomenal organization. So anybody have any questions? Or I know that was probably overwhelming and not all that interesting. <laughs> it was interesting. I, I have a question with comment for you. And I have a question for Dan, actually, about his presentation because I spent three years in a law library at the beginning of my career, so I understand all of this. And Dan, I had to bill for my time, and I was just a reference assistant and literally had a minimum number of hours. And that was in 97 to 2000. Like I had to, I couldn't leave for the week if I hadn't billed a, a minimum number of hours, mm -hmm. which was a lot. But um, Dan, my question for you is, you talked about SLA, so you're to the national president and you can't even fill... Okay, so that's that's a big concern that you're not filling all the officers. I'm not the I'm not the national president. I'm I'm the, I'm oh, the president of the, lo the, the local. local okay. <laughs> okay, you're the local president, and you can't fill it locally with all of our special libraries here in Illinois. I think you'd be surprised at how grave the situation has become. Okay, that's that's a big deal. That makes me very nervous. So, um, is there a way we can help as members of the board of the Rails board to help? Is there a list of special librarians we can reach out to and encourage them to be involved? Because that without that support of without a full board, it's going to be hard to do to help and to drive change. I don't I don't think you have an answer now, but if there's something we can do as not, you know, as rails, let us know. Like if there's a list yeah, of people to call and just chat with or something. I appreciate that. Yeah, I I, I get the sense that um we have really, over the past 10 years, um, the membership has been really stressed to fill a lot of roles and to, to refill roles. And, you know, I was back in November, I was uh, probably like October, November, I was sending out be very beggy emails being like, hey, I know that you were president, you know, two years ago, would you come back on the board, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and it's a sad, it's a sad state of affairs when that happens. But, um, you know, I, so I, I I think that the problem is, and there are some things that you can do, and I, I would just say, um, you know, like educate yourself more on what SLA Illinois is, what, what uh, SLA is as an organization. Um, that, that, that is very helpful. Uh, we post all of our events to L2, um, so you can find our events in L2. So if you want to 
Oh, a lot of our events are open to anybody that you don't have to be a member. Um, but, uh, but I'll say that, um, you know, that, and there's a lot of organizations that I feel, I feel like are feeling this pinch. I've talked to people at the Chicago, uh, area archivists, uh, Chicago, Chicago archivists, Association. this were having trouble recruiting people, the, uh, call the Chicago, uh, law library association. They are feeling that. that. <laughs> They, I think I, they, they have a much wider, bigger board, uh, much, you know, much more top down th- than ours is. Um, but, but they have also struggled to fill, fill positions. Um, and I think it's just people are, people are stressed. People are, um, yeah. 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 And it's true. A lot of it, it's a lot of one person. Yeah. I mean, I, I know some people who are in Illinois special libraries and it's, it's hard to make meetings, but maybe with the move to digital, people can like Zoom meetings, people can do more. Maybe the Zoom meetings are very helpful for yeah. specials. Yeah. Um, definitely. One way that um, the, the library system board, in all honesty, I don't remember if it was Rails or DLS at the time that this happened, but they were able to, I had a funding change mechanism change. I needed a funding mechanism change, and it's a legislative change for me. So I was able to work with the, uh, with the, rails and um the illinois library association they actually picked up the bill and through their lobbyist and um really supported uh the, the change and all the all the librarians were super into supporting a special you know a special need so um that that was really encouraging to see how the, the library community as a whole backed up um a need that was very specific to special libraries well, that leads me to another question I have for maybe it's for Dan um, more, but that led me to Ireland because, you know, Rails has done all this work to get more information and learn more about special libraries and include them. What is ILA doing? And like, for example, does SLA Illinois have like some of the other interest groups, a slot they're allowed to fill at ILA annual? So that we can always have a special library program. And if they don't, I can make a call and ask that that happens at least. I mean, that seems like a way to start infiltrating. I think it used, I actually think it used to happen because there used to be, uh, there, I, I, I was treasurer before I was, um, before I was on the president track for SLA Illinois. And there used to be a budget line um, to send people to the ILA conference um, and, and participate in the ILA conference. And actually, I think there used to be a budget line to have a table uh, or have some sort of uh, you know exhibitor booth at the ILA conference. So I know that there was some some sort of collaboration, and I think maybe there was actually some um, some back and forth. This is a little known fact, but SLA Illinois and uh, the and ILA actually jointly run the jobs board, the ILA jobs board. Um, so we uh, this is, I don't know I have no idea when this started. This must have been way 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 back, but we we share uh, we share the responsibility behind it. Um, mostly it's ILA, but. Um, it's something that we've uh, continued with for a long time. So we do we do have that. I, I just don't think that there's been the emphasis to do programming through ILA in the past. I think um, you know traditionally we've uh, SLA has done its own programming. I think we would welcome any help um, because I think we're we're at the point um, you know we, we just we're that's why we've opened up a lot of our programs to anybody that wants to attend is because we want people to know about us. We want people to that know that we exist. I think the root of it, Becky, is the fact we are solos and or the, the programming, ILA programming back in the day when S- when specialized mm-hmm. libraries were healthier, had stronger staffs, and we're not as stressed. A, a lot of us did partner or were asked to partner right. in ILA programming, and we, we readily did, and we had a great time with it. We really pushed out, but I think now with the fact that we are all so stressed and wearing 12,000 right. hats and only 24 hours in the day, that the program, though we would love to do the programming, and we think it's very important, our own organizations have to come first right now. Right, no, definitely. But yeah. something even as small as saying, hey, from the ILA level saying, and that's a place I can at least advocate and ask, there should be one slot that is allowed for SLA, for example, Illinois, to pick a program. I mean, that happens for a lot of other groups too, right? At ILA, there's like the trustee forum can sponsor a program. It might be a way just to get a program to start increasing awareness. I don't know. I'm not against it yeah. at all. I, mean, I like I'll that idea. At least, yeah. I'll at least yeah. suggest it. That's how awareness gets. I mean, back in the day, I fought for Reader's Advisory to be allowed to be added as a track, for example. 
And I fought really hard for years and now it is. And now you find multiple readers advisory programs, whereas they used to be like one. So it's, but if you get one, it's a way to increase. Because when you, when you submit, by the way, because I just submitted a bunch of programs, specials is one of the boxes to click off. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's on the radar. Yeah, Becky, we're, we're not in the position now on any help that we can get so um if you if you are interested okay, well, in doing I that overstep without permission no no so. no, 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 no. <laughs> oh no, that's great yeah and, and I, one quick question dan the top of the presentation you had mentioned you're losing four special libraries a year i assume you mean the libraries are ceasing to exist not that they're pulling out of rails so that's the, the same the thing themselves Oh, okay. Well, it's it, uh, in some it's, uh, sorry. I should I should be clear. In some in some circumstances, that is the same thing. They stop to exist. Um, you know, like the actual the entire library just like just you know they convert it into else or whatever. Um, in some cases, it's the librarian is no longer in the library, so they have to withdraw. Um, in, in a lot of circumstances, and and I went to into detail more in that uh, in that Rails Board Advocacy Committee meeting, but it, I will say a huge number of this is hospital mergers. Um, we've seen a huge, the, you know, advocate gets taken over by Aurora, you know, University of Chicago buys up all the hospitals in the, on the south side of Chicago and the ones that were independent and had um, hospital libraries in them all go away. And that happens so frequently. Um, that's been, that's been a huge so culprit over the last few years. So, so it's more, it's more of like a corporate dollars and cents decision, not they had a library and they retired and they couldn't find anybody that wanted to be a special librarian. So then they, then they closed it. It's, it's more like a, a budget dollar retirement thing. Yeah. So I can, I mean, I can, I can go really deep into the reasons for a lot of these. Um, but, yeah. uh, you know, but, but that is a huge part of it. Retirements are a part of it. Um, I, I, you still, I mean, I, I've talked to some people at U of I, um, at the, um, uh, at their pro that their ILS program, and there's still a lot of interest. There's a, still a student chapter at uh, U of I that uh, that focuses on SLA, and uh, there's a lot of interest from students to become specialized librarians. I don't think that there are any positions yeah. these days. Wow. Uh, okay. Mon yeah. Monica Tolva has been, had her hand raised for a long time, so I want to. I don't want to bring it up. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. I know it's hard. Um, I, I, next next month, I'm going to come in person to, to Burr Ridge to be part of the fun. But thank you, Dan, for noticing. First of all, I just want to say thank you guys for sharing and and um, uh, sending love to you, Hallie, and knowing how hard it is <laughs> to you. be solo, to have people want your beautiful space, and your space is beautiful. So know, know that um, uh, I feel you. And actually, the previous question was exactly my question, was just to get a clarification. Is it just that special? Special libraries were losing their membership in SLA, or they were ceasing to exist. And so you you answered um, the same question for me. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, no problem. And and I will say that sometimes sometimes it's really um, well known libraries, um, like like museums that you've all heard of, um, like corporations that you've all heard of. Um, household household names that are that are basically saying, okay, you know, this person's retiring, we're not going to fill that position again, or you know, uh, ooh, that space is really nice, we could we could put a lot of offices in there, and um, and then it disappears, and their library goes online, which uh, I don't even know what that means in a lot of circumstances. So yeah, it, it, it's it's fairly frequently, and I'm saying, and I would say without being doom and gloom, uh, which I I'm sorry that I, maybe I am that it is accelerating and has accelerated over the past two years. So get an interesting picture this year. I've had a, a thought in my mind since he started talking and this kind of going back over my mind about what I know about, what I know about special libraries and you know, being interested in them early in my career, kind of imagining that. And even <laughs> thinking back to library school and presentation, coming to my intro class, I'm a special librarian. And I was thinking about the tension between um, library collaboration and being in a for-profit library where competitive intelligence is then the library is the centerpiece of that. And I'm kind of, I'm, I know you're in a you're in a public serving special, and a lot of publics are I mean, a lot of specials are public serving, but that feels like a very big dividing line in my mind. And I, and I think it would really ice a lot of really good opportunities for collaboration. I'm just kind of interested if you have any sense of how that how that undermines your ability to work collectively 
and you may not have a good view of that based on the fact you don't work in a, yeah. a poor profit, but I'm just kind of curious what anybody thinks about work collaboration and competitive intelligence don't really work together very well. I think when you say competitive intelligence, it also addresses Scott's and Monica's and what Dan, question what Dan said is that a lot of the libraries are being restructured and are no longer considered libraries, but competitive intelligence um, or knowledge management right. or um, some, sometimes are absorbed into like the PR departments. Sure. Or customer service department. So the librarian is still there. They are just not seen as a librarian per se. They're seen more as a competitive intelligence gatherer. I just remember the the, the librarian ran the, the McDonald's corporate mm -hmm. and she was like talking to her class and she's like, I can't tell you what databases you subscribe to. That is absolutely not part of the conversation. I can't tell you anything <laughs> about how we do anything, but feel free to ask questions. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. I, I have vendors that I cannot share what I pay for for other, and I always make them take that clause out. Um, that I couldn't call the DuPage, I couldn't call Lenny to DuPage and say, like, "Hey, I'm getting this. Do you already have it? What are you paying for it?" They have a clause in there that says I cannot do that. But like I said, I always make them take oh, that. That's frustrating. And that's ridiculous because we that's do what that constantly do all, the time. all day long. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. But in the specialized arenas, they they often have those clauses. It makes me wonder if cooperative purchasing is a way for libraries to work together without directly working together. Right? Is there a, like kind of an interesting way of in terms of databases, that's not possible. We can't even work within the county. In terms of collaborative databases, because my Lexus account, I legally cannot access the same information that the state's attorney's office is accessing through their really? Lexus account. Um, so we even have have issues within our own organizations in terms, at least on, in online licensing and cooperative licensing. Well, something that you said earlier, Hallie, really kind of resonated. Uh, if you think of, you know, what there's four types of librarians, let's say, you know, school librarians, public, academic, those are very well defined and like, and then there's just like everything else is lumped yes. in one category. <laughs> and there's, there's hardly any, in theory, commonality between their missions and it's hard to, yeah, there's no let's go team, like, because they it may not feel like a team because it's just a loose coalition of, you know, a hundred different unlike each other things you know, it's just exact it's difficult exactly. yeah. so I, I just i cannot stress enough that rails is doing a, not as good a job as they can because <laughs> it's god's point there there is no there's very little commonality other than our core philosophies sure yeah so. okay any other questions it's fun <laughs> okay uh Thank you, Hallie and Dan. That was a very interesting conversation. And uh, I, I'm sure we'll hear some more about it in advocacy and probably at another board meeting. Um, next up is the Rails board member reports. Does anyone have anything uh, they'd like to talk about their library, what things are going on at the library uh, now that we're uh, in a more open state? Hopefully there's some more things going on. Yeah, I've got a couple of things. Uh, so we are uh, um, sort of cautiously, tentatively returning to some of our bigger events. So April 9th, we have our annual STEM Fest event, which um, got canceled literally the day before we uh, went into quarantine in 2020. So we haven't had this event since 2019. Um, so we're pretty happy about that. And we're going to do some things to meter the number of people in the building at once and whatever. But that, that event in 2019 had nearly a thousand people show up. Um, so, you know, we don't know what to expect, but uh, <laughs> we know that there's an appetite for returning to these types of things. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, and then we've already started planning for our largest event of the year in July. July 23rd is our Comicopolis event, which is a comic, comic, comic con fandom type of event. And in 2019, we had 2,000 people show up to that, <laughs> and uh, that's an indoor-outdoor event, mostly outdoor, um, so we're slightly less worried about that one because it's mostly outdoors, but uh, yeah, so maybe maybe it's kind of a return to normalcy this summer for us. We'll see. It's exciting. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, Chris. 
Um, since we're talking about big events, the first weekend in March, um, we had the Northern Illinois Lego Train Club out to the library. That brought in 1,600 people over Saturday and Sunday. Wow. So we were really wow. happy. I don't think we've seen like 1,600 people in like a month. <laughs> <laughs> so I think people are ready to go back. I kind of think Legos Great. might have really been popular during the pandemic as well. Yes. So, so. Yeah. You're right. My son went back to them as a 17 year old, for sure. At, at the new Lenox Public Library District, uh, yesterday was two years from the uh, passage of our successful referendum. Yeah. Uh, it was Good. also the week that we closed due to COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the last two years did not go exactly the way we planned, but now that things are starting to reopen, uh, we finally have the funding to be able to expand hours. We added some Sunday hours uh, during this past year. We've been able to hire additional staff for outreach and uh, expanding our digital media lab and have some really exciting renovations coming up in the next couple of years. So um, construction is going to start on our uh, expanded digital media lab soon. Hopefully we'll be able to invite you all out uh, sometime later this year, summer or fall for the, the brand. That's exciting. Sunday hours, especially, yeah. are exciting. Alex, was that, a, was that a, a limiting rate, an operating rate referendum, or was it a building? Uh, no, it was it was uh, operating. Cool. Yeah, we we had paid off um, oh. bonds from the construction of our building back in two thousand one, so it was no overall increase. Right. The, the building bonds went away, and we increased the operating oh. rate awesome. the same amount. Yeah. Fantastic. Good move. Cool. Any other announcements anyone would like to make? Okay. Uh, if not, we'll uh, go on to the uh, meeting recap and agenda building for the next board meeting. Uh, the next board meeting will be Friday, April 22nd at 1 o'clock. Uh, included on the agenda will be an executive committee recommendation for the filling of the vacancy. Uh, when Patricia Smith resigned, uh, we will have the Rails quarterly consortial reports. Uh, RSA is working on theirs right now as we're talking. Um, an update on the Rails discounts and group purchase offers uh, with Lila Heath. Uh, Jennifer McIntosh and Dr. Denise Cody uh, will give an update on open education resources. Uh, I think that'll be really interesting. Uh, anybody just else want to add anything and else? C-O-T. I'm sorry to miss. Say that again, John? Her last name is Cote. C-O-T-E. Cote? It's pronounced Cote. Cote. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes. Sorry for nothing. Uh, any, anything else for the upcoming meeting? If not, uh, we will be going into closed session. Uh, the board will move into closed session to discuss matters pertaining to collective negotiation as per five Illinois compiled statutes, chapter 120, paragraph two, section two, C2, which states exceptions. A public body may hold closed meeting to consider the following subjects. Uh, number two, collective negotiation matters between the public bodies and its employees or their representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees. Uh, may I have a motion to move into closed session? Moved, Allie. Second, Karen. Allie, thank you. A second? Karen, second. Okay, thank Karen, you. second. <laughs> thank you, Karen. Uh, Emily, will you please call the roll? Yes. Ellie Cox. Yes. Robin Hollenthal. Yes. Diane Hollister. Yes. <coughs> Jennifer McIntosh. Yes. Scott Clinton. Yes. Becky Spratford. Yes. Beth Teppen. Yes. Monica Tolba. 
Yes. Alex Vancina. Yes. Karen Voidick. Yes. Sue Busenbark. Yes. <clears throat> Thomas Stack. Yes. Chris Kenny, I'm here. Okay. I got you, Chris. Thanks. We're now out of executive session. Uh, there are no actions to follow up to from the closed session. Uh, so I would like to thank you all for your attendance today. And since we have no further business, I would like to adjourn this meeting at uh, five minutes or what, three, three forty-five or three twenty-five. Excuse me. Too much glare on the Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great week.